Good to uh, be here with you and uh, happy birthday, Barbara. Really, really excited about that. That's wonderful. What a wonderful occasion to cultivate gratitude, right? And uh, we'll explore a little bit more in this series how to treasure each day of this precious human life we've been given. And one way to do that is to uh, cultivate um, sympathetic joy, right? To feel joy in the accomplishments and uh, milestones and in the well-being of others. So Barbara, thanks for giving us this opportunity to cultivate sympathetic joy as a gateway into gratitude today. And uh, we're actually going to begin with a little bit of chanting. So uh, Kat, who's working behind the scenes here, is going to grace us by putting the uh, uh, text up. This is actually a P.U. a liturgical poem composed by Rabbi Shema'aya Kuson, who was a 16th century Paitan, a liturgical poet from North Africa. Um, and in this uh, beautiful um, poem, he invites us to pay attention to the radiance of the soul, the radiance of the soul, and to use the radiance of the soul as a foundation for cultivating gratitude. Uh, each morning and uh, many uh, North African and um, um, Hasidic communities actually uh, printed this in their Sidur and they recite it every morning and the rendition I'm going to share this morning comes from the Breslov community. It's a Breslov tune, Hasidic tune. Uh, feel free to listen and let it wash over you or you can uh, sing along if you'd like and you can see the translation there and there's transliteration to help you as well. Simule el haneshama leshem shvov yachlama veorak yorachama. Shiva Taim Ke Or Aboke Oh Opal, amethyst, and gold. As bright as the sun's warm glow. Sevenfold brighter than the light of morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And Kat, you can take the screen share down. And I want to invite everyone now who feels moved to do this to actually uh, write into the chat. And on a scale of one to five, rate your level of gratitude right now in this moment, right? One is no gratitude. <laughs> totally, you know, embittered, <laughs> you know. Um, 
and unappreciative and five being wow grateful through the roof right so grateful to be alive to be here you know just check that out okay there's nothing wrong whatever whatever is true for us is true for us right we can acknowledge it with truth and with kindness wow a lot of grateful people here and uh, I'm feeling really grateful to be here with you as well. I thought that I'd put together this series in antici anticipation of Thanksgiving. As it turns out, you know, the fact that it falls during election week is also serendipitous. And tomorrow we'll um, explore a direct connection with uh, Election Day and uh, <coughs> some of the challenges that we're experiencing as a society and as human beings who are in that society, shaped by that society, responsive to that society, co-contributors to creating that society, right? Uh, today, I'd like to focus on the foundation for all our work, which is going to be uh, really a foray into spiritual awareness as the foundation for gratitude. And uh, we saw in that liturgical poem that Rabbi Shemaya Kuson invites us to pay attention to the radiant, warm light of the soul. And our tradition asserts that the soul is the foundation for our spiritual awareness, right? The soul is innately aware and awake and radiant and luminous. And we can shine its light into our lives more brightly as a foundation for cultivating a grateful heart. Just a couple of words about the series um, so that we uh, can know where we're headed and know what we're about to do. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, on Wednesday, we'll explore the character trait of histapkut. Histapkut from the word must speak enough, right? Our capacity to cultivate a sense of enoughness, right? I have enough, I am enough, we are enough, right? There is enough um, as a foundation for culti gra cultivating gratitude. And I just want to say right here and now that um, as you're arriving here, just as you are, you already have everything you need to cultivate a grateful heart. And I'm not going to be giving you anything you don't have um, I'm only going to be reminding us of how to use and pay attention to what we already have as a way to cultivate gratitude. Um, each day of this series will be a standalone, um, but this series also has an arc to it as we examine different skillful means, different facets right, of this quality of, of gratitude and how to cultivate it uh, from day to day as we deepen our practice. And all of the practices taught from day to day will be mutually reinforcing. So don't worry if you can't make it for a day or two, you'll be able to drop back in and feel right at home. Um, we're also going to be providing each day a brief teaching to frame our practice, followed by a period of silent meditation, mourner's kaddish, as we usually do. But as Mark said, uh, the length of our period is a little bit longer. We're going to end formally by 1.15 with meditation and mourner's kaddish. And then those who wish to stay on can stay on for an additional 15 minutes, I understand that Mark needs to leave a little bit early today, so I'll hold space when he takes off up until half past the hour for those staying on for um, questions and responses. And each day we're going to touch upon a specific practice um, and the ways in which it addresses some specific obstacles to cultivating gratitude. Right? And the practice will be a support in how to overcome those obstacles. And um, I also want to uh, invite us each day to extend the practice beyond this time, right? Because gratitude is not just something that we want to have when we're meditating or when we show up, you know, for a specific session, but really we want to cultivate it, you know, in the context of our daily lives as a foundation for our flourishing and well-being. And so each day I'll provide a little assignment. You know, you can choose to accept it or not. That's up to you. But uh, I'll, I'll offer something should you wish to extend your exploration and practice. Um, finally, the, what I'd like to invite you to do is to keep a little journal this week, right? And kind of record in your gratitude journal both, uh, you know, what you learned in practice, but also um, things that you're grateful for. Making a record of a couple of things you're grateful for every day, perhaps first thing in the morning or before you go to bed at night. And just notice how that impacts your baseline level of gratitude. We'll come back to this later, but our tradition teaches that every day we should recite a hundred blessings. And I think that's the rabbi's way of saying, you know, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how difficult things are, at least a hundred things are going well. If you're paying attention, if 
you're paying attention. Right? They're easy to miss, but if you're paying attention, if you take the time to intentionally look carefully at what's going on in your life, there are at least 100 things in your life every day that are going just perfectly. Right? Okay, so I'd like to pull up that screen share again as we dive into our teaching for today. Thanks, Kat. And uh, <clears throat> if you want to listen to the chant again, you can uh, see this recorded session on our YouTube channel or visit the website piute.org and enter the name of the um, poet and you'll be able to find a number of different renditions, not only the one that I just sang today. And Kat, if you could scroll down a little bit to our framing number two. So just wanted to uh, go back to this verb in Hebrew, which is such a beautiful verb that we use for gratitude. Many of us know it from the moda or moda'ani prayer. But the actual verb in our tradition for cultivating gratitude is yud dalad yud or yud dalad he, right? Which actually carries in it, embedded within it, two different um, meanings, right? The first is to give thanks, like the word toda, right? But actually embedded right there in the word itself is another meaning, right? Which is to acknowledge, right? Lehodot doesn't only mean to give thanks in the infinitive form, it also means to acknowledge, as in acknowledging the truth of what is. As in acknowledging the truth of what is. So right there, embedded in the Hebrew uh, root for the word gratitude, right, uh, or the verb uh, for gratitude, is a recognition that when we can acknowledge the truth of what is, that that act itself, right, naturally gives rise and spontaneously gives rise to gratitude. Okay? We actually find these two meanings in uh, a number of biblical usages of the verb. First with Leah, right, um, uh, Jacob's wife, who had already born uh, three children, Reuven, Shimon, Levi. Uh, she thought she wouldn't have another child. Um, and in fact, some time elapsed before she did. But finally, she became pregnant again, says the, the verse from Genesis 29. She bore a son, saying, this time I will give thanks, Ode, Ode which we saw in the poem, right? Odela El, I will give thanks to yud heh vav -Hey, right? The oneness of being, um, the ground of being, being unfolding. Our name for God, of course, is a, a verb, not a noun, right? Um, well, we can talk about that at great length another time, maybe for another series. But therefore, she named him Yehuda, right? We know this name as Judah in English, Judah. The name Judah actually means thanks, right? Yehuda, the thankful one, the one for whom I'm thankful the one over whom I gave thanks. So here we find the conventional uh, connotation of the word lehodot, to give thanks, right? And that's actually embedded in the name Judah. Of course, we are Yehudim, right? We are descendants of the Judeans. And therefore, you know, embedded in the name of our people is the act itself of offering gratitude. But if we turn to Genesis 49, and Kat, perhaps you can scroll down so we can see both this page and the one to follow where uh, Jacob is at the end of his life, it's the end of the book of Genesis, and he's giving each of his sons different blessings. And the blessings are um, uh, also visions of the future. They're prophecies, right? So they're, they're actually, um, in some ways, uh, harbingers of what's to come. And he turns to Judah and he says, Yehuda, ata yoducha, there's that verb, yoducha achecha, um, right? Yadcha be'oref oivecha yishtachavu lecha b'nei avicha which translates as, O Yehuda, right? Your brother shall acknowledge you. Yoducha, that's the same verb, Yoducha. Your brother shall acknowledge you, right? Maybe now, right, because you're not the firstborn, you're not recognized as the ascendant one. But in the future, right, you will be recognized as the ascendant one. Your hand shall be on the nape of your foes. You'll be victorious in battle. And your father's sons shall bow low to you, right? And of course, the tradition understands this to be a prophecy about the Davidic line, right, which will issue from the seed of Judah at some point. But here we find that second connotation, right, of acknowledgement, right? acknowledging what is, acknowledging what is. And, uh, <coughs> you know, um, Acknowledging what is actually has two separate dimensions to it that go hand in hand, right? One of them is, is simply bearing witness to the truth and acknowledging the truth, right? Acknowledging what is. <laughs> you know, uh, in this case, you know, the brothers may have been uh, really attached to the idea that Ruvain is firstborn, you know, is the one who uh, gets the blessings of, of primogeniture, right? And ascendancy as such. 
But actually, it turns out that Judah will be ascendant, right? And they could have fought tooth and nail against that truth, right? But there's a sense that at some point, they'll come to acknowledge that truth, right? But another component of, of that also is the sense of holding the truth with a sense of balanced acceptance or equanimity, or equanimity, right? And so it's true in my personal life that um, when it comes to cultivating gratitude, there's kind of two things that get in the way. There are many things that get in the way, but in terms of today's particular teaching, right, there are two specific things that get in the way, two obstacles or hindrances that, that arise. The first is that often I'm not really paying attention to what is, right? And so the ability to acknowledge what is isn't available to me because I'm not really fully present. And if I'm not really present and paying attention, I can't really know what is, let alone offer gratitude for what is, right? And the second is that in addition to being fully present and noticing what is, right, I can actually grow in my capacity through practice to meet it with a sense of balanced acceptance, with equanimity, right? Um, and that can help me to overcome my kind of one-sided conditioned preferences, desires, right, aversions, and so on and so forth, which often get in the way of gratitude, right? If, if I'm paying attention to what is, but I, what I really want is something other than what is, <laughs> Right? It's going to be very hard for me to be grateful for what is. Right? But if I'm paying attention to what is in the present moment, I acknowledge it, and I also hold it with some degree of equanimity, right? with warmth, with acceptance, then I can actually cultivate, through the act of paying attention, um, some gratitude for what is. This actually happened to me, and Mark has heard this story, and some of you may have, when I was grieving my father when he passed away about, at this point, two and a half, almost three years ago. And uh, I remember sitting with the grief one day, and I, you know, grief, as we know, it's not very pleasant. It's a very unpleasant emotion. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I had this moment of turning toward the grief and acknowledging it and say, okay, okay, here you are. You know, this is unpleasant. You're welcome to be here. You're welcome to be here. I acknowledge you. I see you, right? And um, I'm, I'm holding you with reverence, with honor, with respect you know, with a sense of balanced acceptance. And in that moment, uh, a quality of gratitude kind of arose spontaneously in my heart, you know, and there was a sense of, wow, like I'm really grateful for this grief because if I was not paying attention to it, if I wasn't acknowledging it, if, if it wasn't working its way through my body, I wouldn't have a feeling heart, a heart of flesh. And wow, how wonderful, how wonderful that grief is here to open my heart and teach me how to be compassionate with myself and others. So in that moment, there was a kind of um, gratitude that naturally welled up through the act of paying attention with some degree of equanimity. And when we say toda in our tradition, right, toda, thank you, it has this sense of also acknowledging what is with this kind of sense of balanced equanimity that can then give rise to gratitude. And we find in, in the book of Esther, right, in describing the Jews, right, us, us people, Right, that the Jews, upon uh, experiencing salvation from the fear that they would be killed, that they would be annihilated right, through Haman's uh, decree, they enjoyed light and gladness, happiness, and a sense of their own preciousness. Right? Ora v'simcha v'sasan v'yikar. Ora v'simcha v'sasan v'yikar is the Hebrew. And likewise, you know, if we come into our Yehudi nature and our, our nature as the gratitude people, the people who know how to acknowledge what is and cultivate spiritual awareness as a foundation for gratitude, right, we might then also experience these qualities of light and gladness and happiness and a sense of our own preciousness and the preciousness of this wonderful human life. And all of this is beautifully summed up in this teaching from Brother David Steinel Rast, right? who says we cannot be mindful without being grateful. As soon as we awake from taking everything for granted, there is at least a glimmer of surprise and a beginning of gratitude. <laughs> so beautiful. So as we turn to practice, you know, I want to lean, and Kat, if you could scroll down, I want to lean on our morning prayer service, right, which so beautifully conveys a kind of orientation to A, becoming aware of this spiritual awareness that we have, this light of the soul that's shining through our mind and our heart and our body each and every moment of our lives, and then using it to actually uh, ground into the body, ground into the body as a source for gratitude, right? This is the technology. We become aware that we are conscious beings, that we are spiritual beings, that there's this kind of luminous, uh, illuminating, 
spacious light flowing out from the foundation or the core of our being. And then from that awareness, we can then uh, shine that light into the body right, and recognize the blessings of being embodied. Um, that's what is, right? Each and every one of us is embodied. And right now, for example, I have pain in my shoulders and in my back, you know, and I can become embittered about that. And I can also at the same time ground my attention into that experience in the body with a sense of equanimity. And as I do that, perhaps some gratitude might arise, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. We have this beautiful teaching from Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, that um, we're all experiencing at times in our lives, probably every day in some way, the blessing of the non-toothache. <laughs> you know, we may have pain in our shoulders and our back, we may have arthritis or some disability or something, you know, it may be painful to walk, to move, um, but, um, you know, there's also the blessing of the non-toothache. And our morning service, actually, of waking up in the morning, right, the prescribed prayers for waking up in the morning invite us to actually begin to notice the blessing of the non-toothache. But first we need to ground into this spiritual awareness as the foundation for paying attention in the way that I'm describing. So you'll notice first thing in the morning, it's been our tradition now for 500 years, and before that, uh, before we started reciting Modani, we recited a, a longer version of Modani called Elohaina Shama, right? But both of them suggest that we can upon waking first thing in the morning and regaining consciousness, we can cultivate gratitude right there, right? And acknowledge that um, we've, we've got this soul that's been returned to us, this consciousness that's been returned to us with compassion. And it comes to us every single day as long as we're alive, right? And that is our spiritual awareness. That's the foundation for our mindfulness. Same in Elohina Shama, right? Notice, I am grateful, I offer acknowledgement before you, master of all deeds, sovereign all souls, blessed are you who restores souls to lifeless corpses. Okay, so uh, first thing in the morning, I have this practice of trying to remember, and I actually set an intention often before I go to sleep, right, to try and remember first thing in the morning to become aware that I'm conscious. And then the question is, how are we going to use this consciousness, right? So if you can scroll down, Kat, you know, the next part of, of our morning wake-up routine, according to our tradition, is to actually pay attention to all of these different blessings of the body, right? So, for example, when we hear the rooster crowing, according to Maimonides, who bases himself on the Talmud, we say the blessing, you are a font of blessing, pure presence, majestic one, who gives the rooster intelligence to distinguish between day and night, right? Which is to say we're offering blessings for the act of hearing, the experience of hearing, we're noticing, wow, I can become aware that I'm listening, I'm hearing right now, right? And that's that's a blessing. That's a source of, of tremendous gratitude. Or when we put on our clothes, we say, you are a font of blessing who clothes the naked. When we put on uh, our head covering, we say, you are a font of blessing who clowns it, crowns Israel with glory, etc. Right? When we rub our hands over our eyes, we say, who opens the eyes of the blind. When we sit up on our bed, we say, who releases those who are bound, and so on and so forth. And if we scroll down a little bit, we see that according to Maimonides, these blessings have no set order. Contrary to what, what, what happens, right, in a lot of synagogues where people come to synagogue and the chazan, the prayer leader, just recites a litany of these blessings, and they're not connected to our more uh, lived experience in the body. So as Maimonides, these blessings have no set order. Each blessing is said at the appropriate time and occasion. For example, if we put on our be belt while still in bed, we say the blessing who fastens Israel with strength. And whenever we hear the rooster crow, whether at dawn or any other time, we say the blessing who gives the rooster intelligence. And if there's no occasion to recite the blessing, it isn't said. Okay. So anyway, the point is, here, and we can stop the screen share, right, that we cultivate the spiritual awareness first thing in the morning, and then we shine it into the body, into the blessings of the body as a foundation for culti cultivating gratitude and recognizing the blessing of the non-toothache or, or the non-headache, right? Uh, or the non-hearing impairment, or the non-vision you know, um, vision impairment. And of course, I recognize there may be some people on this call who are impaired in some way in their bodies, right? but we don't have to say the blessings that don't apply to us. We pay attention to what is working well in our bodies, to what is operating normally you know, and miraculously. So we're going to follow his signposts uh, here, and we're going to, that is Maimonides' signposts and the signposts of our tradition to gr guide us in practice. And I am going to offer some words of guidance today, but I'll try and offer plenty of silence in between the words as well to enable us to fully land and settle and pay attention to our experience. Okay, so if you feel ready, you can settle in to a posture that feels relaxed, calm, and at the same time alert, upright. 
And perhaps just take a couple of deep and intentional breaths. The eyes can be open or closed, whichever feels um, stabilizing and resourcing for you. If you're keeping them open, it's a good idea to allow them to be somewhat downcast and uh, you can either focus on a particular point on the wall or on the floor or let the vision be a little bit soft and undirected. And take a couple of moments to ground and settle in the body, taking some deep breaths in to oxygenate the blood and Provide us with a sense of uplift and buoyancy, and then on the outbreath, relax the whole body. Settle more deeply into your seat. And each moment, we have an opportunity to wake up, just like we do in the morning when we actually wake up from our slumber. And we do so very simply by noting and noticing, wow, in this moment I am conscious. I am aware. And I don't even have to do anything to be aware, right? This is a gift given freely each day, each moment. There is this awareness, this luminous, radiant space that knows and in which all of my experience arises. Right? This isn't an abstract awareness. We can feel it shining forth from inside of our being, from our core. We can feel its radiance, its luminosity its vibrancy, its inherent peacefulness and equanimity. And even here we can begin to cultivate some gratitude. We might say, Mode, Moda, Ani, thank you. Thank you for making me conscious. Kol zeman shane shama bekirbi mode ani lefanecha. As long as this consciousness, this spiritual awareness, this soulful essence of me, is here within me. I offer gratitude and acknowledgement before the one, before the presence. And as long as we're conscious, we know we're alive. As long as we're conscious, we can become aware of the manifold blessings of our lives.
if at any point during this practice your mind wanders off and you find yourself lost in mental time travel somewhere off into the future stuck somewhere in the past planning, fixating, remembering daydreaming caught up in cycles of rumination experiencing a kind of spiritual slumber all you need to do is wake up and return to consciousness and cultivate a sense of wonder wow I can wake up. I don't have to be lost. I don't have to be caught in habit. I don't have to live in a dimly lit fantasy life. And then when you're ready, we're going to ground our consciousness into the body and begin to recognize, acknowledge with some degree of balanced acceptance or equanimity what's here in the body, here and now. Not as an idea or an abstraction, but as our lived experience. I'm going to offer the morning blessings as signposts, as invitations to pay attention to certain embodied experiences. If for whatever reason a particular blessing doesn't apply to you, if it doesn't center your experience, your level of ability, that's fine. You can always come back to the breath or the feeling of contact between your chair and its support. with a sense of balanced acceptance, equanimity, curiosity. And notice if a glimmer of gratitude may arise simply by paying attention in this way, simply by acknowledging what is. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר נתן לה שכבי ואינה להבחין בין יום ובין לילה. Blessed is the majestic presence for helping the rooster to distinguish between day and night. An invitation here to pay attention to the experience of hearing. Perhaps you might direct this spiritual awareness, this mindfulness toward sounds that are arising in the here and now, making contact with your ear. Simply acknowledging the texture, the duration, the quality of sound arising, moving, passing away, changing. With balanced acceptance. and inclining the mind, as it were, toward gratitude.
Instead of taking sound for granted, we can actually tune in, pay attention, recognize the blessing of hearing. You might choose to stay here at the sense doorway of hearing. That would be fine. You could stay here the whole session. Or if you want, you can now direct your attention toward your clothing. Blessed is the presence who clothes the naked. Feeling the sensations of contact between our skin and our clothes. Noticing softness, warmth, different textures. How do our pants or our skirt feel different from our blouse or our shirt? If it's helpful, you could even rub your hands against your clothing. And again, we begin with simple acknowledgement, right? Wearing clothes is like this. The sensations of the clothing against my body are like this. And we meet them with balanced equanimity. Of course, preferences may arise. I like this sensation. I don't like that sensation. That's okay. We can notice that too with balanced equanimity. Let go of those preferences and simply notice the sensation of contact between our body and our clothing. You might also consider just for a moment how many processes and people and beings contributed to creating our clothes. Right here and now, our soul can recognize that our clothes connect us with the whole universe, past, present, future, all beings. And we have to bring this sit to a close in just a moment. So when I ring the bell, I invite you to open your eyes with the instructions, blessed is the presence who open the eyes, opens the eyes of the blind. Right? Simply notice color and form and shape and the blessing of being able to see if you're able to see. Taking the wonderful play of light and shadow and see, you, see if you can see with this spiritual awareness. 
And then in the day that follows between now and tomorrow, you can consider on the source sheet looking at the list of blessings and seeing if you might use them in your practice either first thing in the morning or as you go about your day to pay attention in this way and cultivate gratitude. Thank you so much, my friend, for, as always, deep and clear teaching and just a beautiful practice, beautiful entree into this week of cultivating gratitude. And we seal the practice as we do every day by offering an opportunity for those of you who are in mourning, observing a yard site, or if it's your custom to join in the cottage to do so, you can put the name or names of those you're honoring today in the chat box now or after we recite Kaddish. And uh, thanks to Kat for sharing the words on the screen. If you are reciting Kaddish, I invite you to join me by rising in body or in spirit to uh, recite the words together. For those who are not reciting Kaddish, just to stay present. And thank you for forming a minyan of comfort and support for those who are. <clears throat> Yit Gadal, Vid Kadash, Amen. Just want to invite people if they want to to rate their love. Oops. Just want to invite people once again to rate their level of gratitude on a scale from one to five now after we've done the practice. And I'll turn it over to Mark. Thanks, Sam. Um, well, I want to thank you, Sam, for again, for leading us beautifully today. And uh, it's really wonderful how this a little bit more spacious time for practicing together. Just a reminder, folks, that we'll be here um, each day this week with Sam leading us to continue this practice. And as Sam mentioned, you can if you miss any sessions, not to worry, you can always revisit them uh, on our YouTube channel. I want to thank Kat for holding our space and thank thank you, Barbara, for sharing your birthday with us. Um, I'm going to send you birthday blessings from all of us. May you be safe and well and blessed in all ways as you enter into this new decade. And um, we're so blessed to have you with us. Um, Friends, if you have questions for Sam about the teaching today, uh, please. Wow, you really, really pumped up the gratitude here, Sam. Look at that. If only we had like a some kind of score scoreboard, we can. Yeah, practice show it graphically. You know, <laughs> practice works. It works. Um, so, if you have a question for Sam, please put it in the chat box. If it is a question rather than just a, a reflection on your the teaching or the practice. Please preface it. Um, yeah, we could do. We next time we'll do a Zoom poll. We actually could do a poll. Um, maybe we'll try that again later this week. So, friends, um, feel free to jump in. I'm going to lead off the questions. Sam, um, I just want to revisit what you said about the kind of dual connotation of the word. You know, first of all, it's really like I don't know if it passed over people, but I think it's just like it's quite an amazing thing to to say that the word the very word uh, Yehudim, Jews, um, that the primary connotation there is gratitude. So people of gratitude, we're not renowned for that necessarily. So that's, it's really interesting to, to note that, number one. 
and also um, to go into that dual connotation of the root of the word of um, that it has this it has the connotation the the connotation of the word gratitude in English, which I think in English has this sense of you know joy and happiness, right? Um, and sometimes it can be about um, the joy and happiness can be about things going our way, right? Or let's look look or we have a phrase actually in Hebrew of hakarat hatov of recognizing the good. And so one of the questions I want to ask you actually is like you know are are we are you distinguishing this practice? From the practice of hakarat hatov, what tov, which may be, yeah, there I got all kinds of serious, all kinds of problems, but uh, I'm going to look for the good, look on the, look for the silver lining, as it were, right? Which it strikes me as, as a little bit is a wonderful practice, not a bad practice, and you know, a Jewish practice, but maybe a little bit different than this practice, which really takes this equation of good and bad out of it, a little bit. It, it this is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Like you talked about just like awareness itself is a state of gratitude. So I want to invite you to talk a little bit about that because it's easy, easy for us, easier for us, I think, to think about gratitude as look for the good, look for the things that I'm happy about or that are going well or um, that are the blessings in our lives, which is this is a more kind of encompassing way of, un of understanding it, I think. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um... Well, first of all, you know, we often have these Hebrew phrases and we don't really pay attention to what they mean. <laughs> so hakarat hatov is a phrase, you know, that means to acknowledge the good. Um, and, uh, you know, from the time I was a kid, my teachers in yeshiva spoke about how we need to, you know, we need to acknowledge the good. When someone does you a favor, you really need to say thank you, you know. Um, that's kind of the traditional connotation. But the word lehakir, hakara, right, actually means recognition. Mm -hmm. Right. So the a literal definition of hakarata tov, right, is actually acknowledging or recognizing, recognizing the good. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, you know, uh, it may be hard to recognize the good when we have, uh, you know, um, grief in our heart or pain in our body or when the you know circumstances in the world are difficult and painful and scary, you know, which they are, I think, now for a lot of us. And, um, you know, tomorrow we'll talk about the practice of Ein Tova, right? cultivating a, an eye, right, that is uh, favorably inclined towards seeing the good, mm -hmm. right, uh, which is an important, you know, native practice in our tradition for cultivating gratitude. But what I'm offering here is that actually our spiritual awareness, right, this kind of soul awareness, you know, that we have as our birthright as human beings, right? This isn't just a, a Jewish experience. Everyone, everyone is conscious and aware, you know. Um, you know that it intuitively, uh, when it when it uh, is directed toward any object, whether the object feels pleasant, unpleasant, easeful, difficult, boring, interesting, whatever the case may be, right? It can see into the essential goodness that underlies reality, right? And as such, even experiences that we might uh, really dislike, <laughs> you know, can at least be experienced with gratitude. Um, doesn't mean we have to accept them. Doesn't mean we don't have to try and change them, right? But that uh, we can sense that there's kind of an underlying goodness behind all of it, you know, pervading all of reality. So uh, I'm going to just interject because I see there are a couple of questions which go to what you're saying that um, maybe can be even more specific like there's one question about dealing with chronic pain right like something that's which i know is something that you've dealt with also about how do how do we um and you spoke also about grief about working with grief um so there was one question about like how do you how does one cultivate that kind of experience that you're describing like of you know of of, of being um you know of acceptance uh, my thought I was thinking acceptance, but not necessarily approval necessarily, but acceptance, recognition um, of when we're going through challenging things. And the other thing is if you can connect this with what you were talking about, about hishtavut, um, equanimity. Yeah. And I'm just going to say this in advance so that I don't have to cut you off again. And I want to apologize to everybody that I, I have to get off a little bit early because I have a 1.30 class of Awareness in Action 
to be on. So I'm going to get off in just a few minutes. I don't want to interrupt Sam. Just fact, I'll just, I'll um, remove my 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 um, visual here so that Sam, you can respond to that. And uh, just want to say thanks again for all you're doing this week, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark, for holding this space so beautifully. And uh, um, we'll see Mark on Wednesday, actually, because tomorrow I'm going to be hosting as well as teaching. Um, thanks, Mark. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I uh, was talking to someone, I believe it was last Shabbat, um, and, uh, uh, and I said, how are you doing? <laughs> he said, uh, today, you know, I feel, I feel uh, blessed. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, I think that we're always equally blessed every day. Right? But we don't always have the capacity to see it, to see that that's the case with equal clarity, right? Um, so we distinguish and we say this was a blessed day, this was a cursed day, you know, this was a good day, this was a bad day, you know. Um, but um, there's a way in which uh, if we just keep paying attention to our experience moment by moment, you know, with some degree of equanimity. There's that hishtavut that Mark is talking about, you know, and our tradition has many, many skillful means for cultivating equanimity. Um, and we can do a you know, whole series on that for years and years and years, not just a week, you know. Same for gratitude. But, but um, you know, when we can cultivate that kind of equanimity, acknowledge what is and drop the embittered resistance, right? we begin to see that there, there are certain kind of underlying patterns uh, to our experience that, you know, that are um, workable, <laughs> right? We can work with it. And as we grow in our capacity to work with our experience moment by moment, no matter its texture, its quality, no matter how the ego feels about it, right, then over time we can also grow into gratitude for whatever arises. Right? So the first, first step is paying attention, right? The second step is coming into a sense of balanced acceptance, right? That then gives us more inner capacity. It gives the heart more capacity to hold whatever is arising without buckling, without uh, becoming resistant and embittered. Right? And then the next step after that is that the heart grows in its capacity to meet whatever is here as an expression of the fullness of life and the essential goodness of life. Right? And when that happens, then we can be grateful for whatever happens, no matter what arises. You know, and again, I'm not. I want to ver make a very clear distinction here. I'm not saying that if there's injustice in the world, we should just cultivate gratitude for it, you know, and look the other way, you know, and say, well, everything is okay with me because I feel grateful, right? I'm not saying that. To be very clear, right? I'm not saying we shouldn't address racism and, you know, gender inequality and uh, climate change and all of these things. But what I'm saying is that the heart, right? When the heart feels grateful and buoyant and spacious and open. It can turn toward what's difficult non-reactively. And in so doing, we can bring forth genuine compassion and not add more, more fuel to the fire. Right? So um, the question I'm asking is a very pragmatic one, right? which is what are the conditions that allow our hearts to swell, to open into gratitude as a foundation for our well-being, for our non-reactivity, for our ability to be with each other in a compassionate way, and to turn toward what's difficult and painful in the world in a skillful, loving, and compassionate way. And um, I think, that, at least for me, the practice of mindfulness, not I think, I know that the practice of mindfulness has been so powerful for me because it has over time, right, just the simple capacity to recognize, first of all, hey, I have this innate capacity to be aware of my experience, right, because I'm conscious, because I have a soul, right? And then to actually shine the light of the soul, its warm glow, its knowing glow, its accepting glow, its spaciousness, right? Uh, toward my moment-to-moment -moment experience, that my heart has grown in its capacity to meet even difficult experiences with some degree of equanimity and gratitude. Right? So I hope that's really clear um, and helpful. And um, just want to check the chat to second to, for a second to see if there are any any other questions. Um, yeah, the divinest process. Say a word or two about that. 
um, in response to uh, Elizabeth's question. You know, um, it's actually very relevant given the, the Torah portion that's coming up, right? <laughs> um, Vayera, right, where, um, you know, God appears to Abraham, and later on in the portion of uh, Vayera, <laughs> in the book of Exodus, you know, uh, God says to Moses, I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by the name El Shaddai, right? but I never made my true name yod heh vav -Hey, known to them. Right? So right here we can already prefigure, you know, what's going to come in, in Exodus, you know. And uh, there's a sense that uh, El Shaddai, uh, which has a connotation of uh, constriction, right? the God who said enough is how the rabbis understand it. Die is enough, right? is, is uh, one, one way in which the divine manifests in the world, right? There's constriction, there's containment, there's suffering, there's limitation, there's duality, there's division, you know. But that's not God's essence. According to our tradition, the name yod heh vav -Hey points to the divine essence, right? And the, 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 the name yod heh vav -Hey is actually a verb, it's not a noun, right? And it suggests the unfolding of being, right? Uh, past, present, and future <laughs> squished into one, right? So there's a, as it were, um, a divine uh, essence that is all process, right? Uh, we might say pure being, right? And what is it in our experience that, that uh, makes us feel that we are, that we be, <laughs> as it were, right? <laughs> because, you know, uh, our bodies change, our minds change, our hearts change, our emotions change, you know, our thoughts change, our beliefs change, you know, our suppositions change. All that's changing, right? So we can see that that's really absolute beingness, as it were, right? But what is absolutely being here and now, right? What is being us, what we are in this moment is this luminous, spacious presence, right? That's what remains, this sense of I amness. Right, is what remains always. So, uh, by extension, we might say that you know the divine I amness, right, is the essence of the divine that undergirds and out of which all of being f unfolds and and uh, and comes into being, right. And we might then say that that is just pure presence, or pure consciousness, right, a field of limitless pure divine consciousness or presence, you know, that unfolds on the level of manifestation as reality as we know it. Okay. And we call that yod heh vav -Hey. So uh, that's a different model from, you know, the God in the sky, you know, who's a being who's looking down on us and rewarding and punishing us, right? On, on the level of this field of being, we're all part of it, right? We're all, as it were, uh, cells within the total divine organism. And therefore, everything we do, think, feel, say, you know, it all, it all ripples throughout the totality, right? And as it were, as such, you know, we have an impact on the divine and on the whole field. And whatever we do is going to ripple through the totality and have some sort of a karmic impact on us and everything else. Okay, so that's just a, a little kind of introduction to God as a verb. <laughs> right? Uh, there's a lot more to say about that. This is really, you know, directly out of the Hasidic tradition. Um, but, uh, you know, um, once we have this experience of our own consciousness as a kind of uh, limitless field of uh, non-dual presence, it right? uh, becomes easier to uh, have an experience of a relationship with and even conceptualize what it might be like to be connected to a limitless field right, of pure presence and, and uh, one that is indivisible, right, characterized by absolute unity. Uh, so we'll have to stop there, my friends. I look forward to seeing those of you who can make it tomorrow for our next installment. <laughs> in the meantime, you have the option to practice with the uh, source sheet that I gave out, you know, that, that kind of provides us a mindful foray into the morning blessings. And you can wake up in the morning and uh, see if you can cultivate some gratitude for this consciousness, for the gifts of the soul and the radiance of the soul, and then shine that light into your body, you know, a couple times throughout the day and just see if that might give rise to a kind of natural sense of of gratitude, a kind of spaciousness, joy, lightness of being. And I'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thanks, friends. All the best.